We're going to consider this verse from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That was in the authorised version because it was the version I used when I preached on it for the very first time, as we shall hear a little later. Here it is in the Revised Standard Version. Only one word has changed. Hath has changed to has. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But before we consider that verse and its teaching, I'm going to lead us in prayer. You can say along with me if you wish, which is why I put it on the screen, or you can just agree silently in your own heart. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who hast caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, when I've considered the cross, which of course is what Isaiah 53 is talking about, the cross where Jesus died, when I have considered the cross, I have passed through three stages. Not understanding it, understanding it, and not understanding it once again. And this sermon, therefore, goes through those stages and represents a kind of beginning, followed by a journey towards perhaps an ending. And if you were in Bradley Road Baptist Church on the 15th of January 2012, you will have heard me preach on this text then. And we are revisiting that text again today. Why January 2012? Well, if you look down towards the end of that road in East Oakley, you'll see a chapel. That is the chapel where I first preached on this verse. So let's go back to stage one, not understanding the cross. This is before I came to faith. And if you count the candles, you will see that it was my 14th birthday. I did not understand what people were telling me when they said that Jesus died for me and that because of his death, I might have salvation. I asked questions like, how can the death of a man 2,000 years ago do something in me? It made no sense to me. I did not understand. I went voluntarily to church, having been dragged along on my part very reluctantly by my parents. But I was growing interested. I had come to believe that there was a God but I still couldn't understand the cross. I enjoyed a good discussion, and I was hoping there might be some attractive girls in the youth group. So I went, first of all, to that church on the left, and then later on to the one on the right, which was nearer to home. I could walk to it, and it was a good deal more lively than the big town centre church. I listened to the minister, there he is on the left, the Reverend Bill Murphy and his wife Joy in the photograph there. And I went to the after service youth squash on Sunday evenings in the home of that couple on the right, Bill and Marion Taylor. And we had good discussions. And I remember the minister, not this one, but another one who was visiting the circuit. I remember him going round each of the young people in the youth group after the service and saying to each one of us, do you have a sense of sin? And I said, no, uh, I don't think I've ever done anything that could be called sin. And so I not only didn't understand what Jesus had done for me on the cross, but I didn't feel any need for it either. 
But then there came a time when my eyes were opened and I did understand. I was now about 15, maybe 16 years old, and I was learning to play the piano. And I was practicing by practicing hymns, because hymn tunes are quite easy to play. And so my eyes were running down the words, and I came to verse 2 of this hymn. I long to know and to make known the heights and depths of love divine, the kindness thou to me hast shown, whose every sin was counted thine. My God for me resigned his breath. He died to save my soul from death. And when I saw those words in the middle of that verse, the kindness thou to me hast shown, whose every sin was counted thine, suddenly I saw it. When Jesus died, it was because my sins were being counted against him. God had foreknown what I would do wrong. And even though I had had no sense of being a sinner, I understood and I believed the teaching. Whose every sin was counted thine. That is what happened when Jesus died, as Isaiah describes by prophecy in chapter 53, verse 6. Well, a local preacher called Len Wardell discovered that I had come to faith. He only lived along the road from us. And he encouraged me in my faith. He used to pray with me and read the Bible to me in his front room. And he started taking me to his preaching appointments. And this went on for some while. And eventually he said to me once, David, you preach the sermon and I will lead the service. And that is what happened. And so we come back to East Oakley and that same chapel that you saw earlier on. And I preached on Isaiah 53, verse 6, the very first time I ever preached any sermon anywhere, 10th of January, 1965. And that is why, when I was invited to preach one January at Bradley Road, I decided I would take the same verse. And this is it, once again, from the Authorised, which I preached on back then. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There are other ways of understanding what happened at Calvary. I call them metaphors here, because I think something happened within God which can only be explained in terms of metaphors. We could say that Jesus took the punishment that was due to our wrongdoing. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. No chastisement is, it's a punishment. In Matthew's Gospel, it's likened to a debt being paid when sin is forgiven. Also in Matthew's Gospel, what Jesus did for us is likened to a ransom being paid to redeem a slave, or of course it could be a hostage these days, but to redeem someone from being in slavery, in bondage, in captivity. The ransom is paid. Christ's blood shed at Calvary, Christ's death offered to God for my sin was like the paying of a ransom. John in Revelation likens the flowing of the blood of Christ to washing away or cleaning away our sin. Psalm 103 likens it to Sin being taken away from us as far as the east is from the west. Again, back to Matthew's Gospel, what happened at Calvary is likened to blood being shed to seal a covenant. That is a solemn, sacred agreement. The agreement made between God and man that he would remember our sins no more. 
and you read in Timothy and also in 1 Corinthians that death was swallowed up in victory. It's as if Jesus absorbed death and then rose from the dead and had conquered it so that it no longer has any power over those who believe. Now, all of these things are aspects of what really was achieved. But I think that they are metaphors taken from the human world for us to understand something of what happened in God's mind and in God's plan and in God's work. Now, it is good to try to understand what Jesus did for you when he died at the cross. But you don't need to understand how it worked to believe and trust any one of the Bible's metaphors brings forgiveness and the gift of eternal life and everlasting salvation. It's called faith, believing it, trusting it. It's called faith. And any one of the metaphors, believe that he was punished in your place, believe he paid a ransom, believe he paid your debt, believe he conquered death and now offers you the gift of immortality. You don't need to understand how it worked. You need to believe and trust. Well, I've been telling you about what happened to me in the 1960s and the years passed. And there you see photographs, the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the 2000s. I became an accredited Baptist minister. I studied theology and church history with London Bible College. I read many Christian books. But I reached stage three. I don't understand what happened at Calvary. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 14. It talks about Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. Something happened at the cross where God the Son offered himself through God the Spirit to God the Father. It was something within God. I can't understand that. Think of 1 Peter 1, talks about the prophets predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory, things into which angels long to look. The angels can't understand it. They know it's real. They know it worked. And they can't understand it. It was within God, God's plan. And I certainly cannot fully understand, but I can grasp one or more of those metaphors enough to save me for eternal salvation. This is expressed in some of our hymns. Think of Elizabeth Cleophane's hymn about the 90 and 9, where the shepherd has a hundred sheep, 90 and 9 of them are safe, one is lost, and he says, I'm going to go out and find that one. Doesn't matter where it takes me, I'm going to find the one I've lost. And look at verse 3. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and helpless and ready to die. That's like you and me in our sin, but he has done all that is necessary for us to be reconciled to God and to become children of God, but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed. Think of Joseph Hart's hymn in Gadsby's collection of hymns, number 88, verse 5. It is far beyond what words express, what saints can feel or angels guess, angels that hymn the great I am fall down and veil before the Lamb. The highest heavens are short of this, tis deeper than the vast abyss, tis more than thought can e'er conceive, or hope expect, or faith believe. Almighty God sighed human breath, the Lord of life experienced death. How it was done, 
we can't discuss, but this we know, twas done for us. And you must have sung this many times, Charles Wesley in Wesley Sims number 201. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? And then look at verse 2. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore, let angel minds inquire no more. Tis mystery all. I don't understand it, but I believe it. I wonder if you've read the line, The Witch and the Wardrobe. I found this very helpful. It may help you. Edmund was one of the four children, and he became a traitor, a betrayer, a deceiver. And he worked against Aslan, the Christ figure. And in the end, the question was raised, how can he be saved from death? How can he be redeemed? Because death is what he has deserved. And Aslan dies for him in a way which the other children don't understand. And Aslan explains that it was due to deeper magic from before the dawn of time. And that helped me to realise that Calvary was planned in the mind of God, between God the Father, God the Son and God the Spirit. Before time began, it was planned in eternity. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslan did for him? No, of course not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. But we believe it was personal. We can say it was for me. You can see that verse written going up the side of my slide. Galatians 2 verse 20. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is something which every one of you watching this video needs to be able to say with complete assurance, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And look at all those people. You see Pentecostals, Primitive Methodists, Evangelicals. You see people in France, in America, in Kosovo, in England, in El Salvador, in Wales, in Guatemala. But each one of them who has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can talk about the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The old chap. George Ford at the top right was a Sunday school teacher at Silchester. I expect you've sung this hymn many times as well by Mrs. C.F. Alexander. We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. Now, Christ's death has been compared with Moses' serpent. The people had been bitten by serpents and they were dying of the poison or venom. And Moses made a serpent of bronze or a brazen serpent, put it up in the desert. And he said, if you look at that, the poison will not work. You will live. All they had to do was look. They did not have to know how it worked. And Jesus took that story from the Old Testament and applied it to his death. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen to these words from Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher. This is talking about his conversion. I turned down a side street and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel there may have been a dozen or fifteen people. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last a very 
thin looking man, a shoemaker or tailor or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit. He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. The text was, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Then he looked at me under the gallery, and I dare say with so few present he knew me to be a stranger, just fixing his eyes on me, as if he knew all my heart. He said, young man, you look very miserable, and you will always be miserable, miserable in life and miserable in death, if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then lifting up his hands, he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist could do, Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but to look and live. I saw at once the way of salvation, like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up. The people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. Oh, I looked. Then and there the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away, and that moment I saw the sun. And that photograph is of the chapel where that happens. I have preached there, and it's in Colchester. Now, you may never hear me preach again, but if you never hear me preach again, remember this text, which I have preached on so often, from 1965, until July 2021, there's the chapel that I preached at in 1965. There I am last week in July 2021. If you never hear me again, remember the text that I preached on to you today and take it to your own heart and believe it for yourself, for your sins, for your eternal salvation. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And God bless you all.